like the YouTube on? Seven, six. Okay. I don't have it on now. Cool. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justine, and thanks for tuning in, and welcome back to the Starboard Portal. Today, we have Phil Muller, the head coach of Two Niner, a high-performance race program based in Miami, Florida. Phil is the Skiffs coach for U.S. Sailing's Olympic Development Program. He has been the Youth World's team coach for the last three years, and he works with the U.S. Sailing team athletes in the NACRA 17 and 49er classes. We're excited to have Phil with us today to share his knowledge on high-performance tactics. Thank you for joining, Phil. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to you um, to talk about high-performance tactics. Cool. Thanks, Justine. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Really appreciate it. I'm um, excited for this opportunity to talk and share a little bit of my experience uh, and racing knowledge from the coach boat, some of our winning strategies, some things that have worked for us, um, and hopefully demystify some, some things about high performance sailing. And I'm going to go through this, our high performance playbook or our uh, racing playbook, and you can use it as a, as a template you know, to, to kind of build your own moves and plays off of. These are some things that we've learned over the years. And I'll say, you know, off the bat, like anything in this playbook that I've gotten right or is relevant or is smart, uh, I've stolen or learned from a mentor, a coach or an athlete. Uh, anything that's like wrong or confusing is definitely uh, of my own authorship. Uh, so just there, a little disclaimer as we get going. Um, jumping on the screen share here, please, uh, you know, drop any questions into the chat as I go through the presentation here, feel free to, uh, and we'll try to get to that and just keep the conversation as dynamic as possible. So I think to kick things off, let's give this conversation some context and define what high performance racing is, you know, what fast boat racing is, what apparent wind racing is. Um, high performance racing is really about split second decision making. The hull speeds are fast, right? Like the hull speeds are 10 to 18 knots for the skiffs. The cats are doing like 22, 24 knots downwind. Uh, kites are going even faster with everything happening at such a, an accelerated rate or on the race course. You know, opportunities for moves open and close in the blink of an eye. And the goal is for me as a coach, you know, for our athletes is to have a really good game plan going into the race. So you already have like a filter for decision making. Um, so you don't miss those opportunities as soon as they open up. And what we're trying to do is build racing plans uh, for high percentage of success. We're looking for those high percentage moves around the race course, not necessarily, you know, what's going to win like the big winners for me the strategy is like how do we get top 10 to the first mark you know and how do we gain two boats on the run coming out of the gate now we're in eighth place how do we get one or two more boats up the field and then pass another boat to the finish and we're looking for that top five position around the track so so let's crack into it so building the playbook you know this playbook is something i personally have been working on and uh, have, have like worked on with the help of so many people, so many coaches in the past four years. Um, this is not a venue specific playbook. This is, like I said, it's a template. Um, so to get started, what we do, as I mentioned earlier, speed is king. Speed is, uh, is the racing that we do, fast hull speeds. You know, but this playbook is not just about like races where you're planning the whole time. Uh, we definitely take into consideration those days that are lighter uh, when you're in displacement mode. But as we start to filter decision-making, we identify first, what kind of day is it? Is it a speed day or is it a leverage day? So what is a speed day? You know, a speed day is when you're planning um, and the priority off the line is to get a good start and you, you need to have a wide lane so that you can mode upwind and really put the throttle down when you have the opportunity to and go fast forward. Or, you know, when you're going to bring those sails in, get the leeches tight and start climbing, climbing, climbing. 
So when we talk about speed, we're talking about moding in the boat. You know, I just gave a little description of that there, putting the bow down to go fast forward or climbing high and shifting gears. Crew and skipper are working together to shift those gears uh, between fast forward or, or high and fast, as Luther would say, uh, with the tacking option more near the corner of the racetrack as you start to get off the starting line and get out to the ley line. Or is it a leverage day? What's a leverage day? Leverage day would be we need to optimize the shifts. Right, like there is a variance to the wind speed, and there is a change consistently in the wind direction. Either we're going to be able to identify a pattern in that, or we're not. You know, but a leverage day is is defined by you must have a tacking lane out. Right, as soon as your bow starts getting knocked, as soon as your numbers start changing on the compass, we need to be able to play those shifts up the field. You know, but we're we're high performance sailing. We're racing fast boats. So one caveat to this whole conversation, one truth, one fundamental truth about this type of sailboat racing uh, or board racing, you know, whether it's kites or windsurfers, this type of race is uh, that tacking is expensive. And the goal therein is to minimize maneuvers up the track, always. Tacks are expensive. Jobs can be expensive unless your boat handling is amazing. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Let's lay out the racetrack just real quick so we know what we're talking about. Um, racetrack is a two lap windward lured. Target time of racing, I would say is between 20 and 30 minutes. Typically it's uh, about, I, I would say 20 minutes would be definitely on the short end. So like 25 minutes to 35 minutes for our races here two laps around the track from the starting line to mark one, it's between nine to 12 minutes of racing. And the downwinds are three to seven minutes long. And we're doing three to four races per day with some time just in between, you know, the, the, the tacking angles are wider, the jiving angles are wider. This is physically demanding racing where your heart rate is elevated, you know, north of 180 at times. And with such physical uh, physical dynamic to the racing, the goal is to simplify. It's hard to make decisions when your heart is just pounding through your head, right? It's hard to communicate well to your teammate and make decisions. So just laying out uh, what parameters we're playing in here, it's good to keep that in mind. As I said, the goal is simplicity. So in our two lap racetrack, one thing we do is consider that there are five routes that we can take around the racetrack relative to the stability of the breeze. And I'll just go through this with you guys right now. So in our racetrack, um, you can sail outside track, you can sail up the inside track, or you can sail an open race course. So as colors that you've seen in this slide, we've got a dark blue 49er here, kind of middle pin end of the line, sailing up the left side and taking port tack lay line to the mark. So that's outside left track. Outside right track would be the starboard tack, lime green boat, starting midline on port, going out to starboard lay line, one tack to the mark. You know, inside track boats are gonna be this light blue and light red, starting near this boat end of the line, middle boat here, light blue going and hitting the top left. So that's an inside left track or this red boat. Quick tack after the gate here, sailing up to the top right of the course. Those are four routes that you can see illustrated. I haven't, um, I'll show you the, the fifth route, which is an open racetrack when you're tacking on shifts, when you see pressure, when you're really puff hunting, that would be the fifth route. That's an open race course. That's gonna be on the next slide. You know, something we like to think about for those of you who play golf, I don't, but I live in Florida, so it's around all the time. Um, you know, each hole in golf has a recommended par, a recommended number of strokes that you take to get your ball in the hole based on how the, uh, the course is designed. And we have the same thing here on the sailboat racetrack. And so what we're deciding is like, what's par for the course on each day of racing. 
And as you can see, those factors there are the velocity, the wind speed, the wind direction, and then the tendency of the fleet. Where are the high traffic lanes? Where are the low traffic lanes? You know, an outside track day is going to be, let's see, if you start on port, you're doing one tack. You know, if you're starting on starboard, you're doing two tacks to the mark. Inside track day is going to be four to six tacks, you know, and then open racetrack, you're, you're more than six tacks to the mark. So let's talk about the decisions that get made around the racetrack. High performance racing, we like to say there's only 12 decisions you have to make. And the thing is, that's where the challenge comes because you got to get those 12 decisions right. You know, we got to have a high success rate for the decisions being made. The goal is to keep it simple. The goal is to stick to your plan. You know, this is one thing that's great. I think a life lesson that skiff racing teaches that high performance racing teaches is like, when you make a plan before the start of the race, you've done your warm up lap, you know, you've sailed up wind, you've set the kite, you've come back down, douse it a few times, you and your teammate are drinking water, having a snack. You've taken in all this observation about racing uh, that, inf that are gonna inform your racing. You kind of get a good idea of what the clouds are doing. You're reading the water well. You know that on port, you're more bow into the waves. We're on starboard, you're more bow parallel to the waves. So you're starting to think about how you're gonna set yourself up for this race. And uh, once your heart rates come down, once you start formalizing your game plan, you say, okay, you, you know, it's pretty cloudy out here, but I know that when the sun pops out, that lefty's really gonna start heating up and coming in. Um, like if we're in San Diego, for example, then we can start to make a game plan. And then in the heat of the moment, in the heat of the moment, when it comes, when we're starting to play the tacking game, when we're starting to have boats under our jib or over our hip, you know, we have a really strong game plan that we've already decided that we can execute on. So what we're looking to do is have hindsight in the moment, hindsight in the moment of racing, where we just uh, stick to and execute our game plan. So what are the 12 decisions to make around the racetrack? Starting off at the, at the start, you know, is it plan A or is it plan B? How high of confidence do we have in our plan A? Let's say we wanted to go inside track left. We're not going to bang the left corner, but we definitely want to get to that top left edge because we know there's good pressure up there. You know, I would say, all right, plan A, plan A is on and we're going to go for it. So we're going to start, you know, put ourselves in a starting position so that we can execute that game plan. So now we're getting off the line. Second decision being made is a check-in. You know, this is like, if you're kind of losing your lane because boats are collapsing around you or the, the boat to windward roll you or you're in the wake of the boat to leeward of you and your foils are just sliding out a little bit, you know, it's a quick check-in where the crew asks the skipper, you know, can we live here? How long can we stay? Um, is this lane working for us? Are we still sticking to, it, to plan A? I would say that that check-in is critical. Moving out up the field, what we're asking ourselves is, is it a, you know, is it a lead back or an edge out day? And I'm going to get to that in a later slide, but essentially this means like, are we going to leave out boats who are under our jib as we get out, out to the corner? Or do we believe in that, in that edge pressure? We're going to get there, you know, where's the next best pressure? Then the fourth decision to be made up the track is like, where's ley line? You know, are we going to it now? And there's a little quote here, one or three, which Charlie McKee likes to say, you know, uh, this means one tack or three tacks. Essentially, are we going to lay line or are we going to take a few more tacks up the field, tacking short of lay line here? And now we're getting to the top, top of the track, we've tacked on lay line at the top, and now it's time to play the downwind game which is where all the fun happens in high performance sailing because the speeds are faster. The kites are up. Jiving is really hard and you know, people are going to crash around you, especially if it's breezy. So what's the downwind game plan? Off the set spinnakers up next decision we make is when to jive. 
you know, when are we going to make that first jive coming into uh, to set ourselves up coming into the gate? Next decision is the final jive into the gate, which is your gate entry, gate, gate exit jive. Coming out of the gate, now I'm at number eight here down at the bottom. Uh, are we up or down? Are we up or down as relative to the compass numbers that you've checked? You know, essentially coming out of the gate, are we getting lifted or are we, are we on that header and need to tack? Coming out of the gate, up or down. Now we go through the same decisions um, that we had on the first upwind. You know, are we still on plan A? Are we leading back? Are we edging the boats out in our pack here? And then we're making a decision on ley line the downwind game plan again, and then uh, when to jive out of the top mark coming into the uh, final jive for the finish here. All right, so what guides these decisions? What guides this decision making around the track? You know, it's rel relative to the wind's stability. And as we think about our five racetracks, this here, this yellow boat going up the field, this is the open race course I mentioned earlier. This was not illustrated earlier. So this is uh, inside track racing. This is open race course. What this boat do, is doing is puff hunting. You know, this is the type of day where in Miami, the breeze is coming out of the north or the northwest off the land. It's really light and patchy. Uh, there are 20 degree shifts all over the place. And what happens on a day like today when it's really unstable? is we know that the edges are super risky because as you increase your leverage on other boats around you, you increase your risk and your exposure. And there's no guarantee that if you chase a puff out to lay line, it's gonna, there's gonna be pressure to carry you back to the mark. So that's your inside track, super unstable day. Um, opportunistic sailing, what's the priority? The priority here is pressure. The other extreme of that, is the most stable wind day. You know, this is an outside track sailing day. The breeze is steady and it is consistent. Uh, the priority is speed and going fast because every time we have to tack, we're slowing down and we're losing distance on the boats around us. What's really exciting in high performance sailing is, uh, is the demand of execution. For, for the boats to perform at top speeds. You know, this is like if you're trapezing on the wire and your hips hit the water, you know, that is a four boat length loss instantly because um, you're slowing down and tacking is even slower. So um, getting back to our racetrack here, stable breeze, we're sending it to the edges because we can have high confidence that there's going to be pressure at the corner of the racetrack to take us back to the top mark there. Why would we sail an inside track course? You know, on this slide, I've got the light blue boats going to the top left. I've got the, the red boats going to the top right of the course, hitting that starboard lay line. So as we're making our game plan, how do we decide top left or top right? You know, this is a day uh, where there's a, some mixing going on. And we have confidence, we don't necessarily have confidence at the edges, but you know, there's kind of consistent breeze. And what you're trying to do here uh, for this inside track day is identify a pattern to the, to the wind's direction or the pattern to the wind's velocity. You know, this isn't the kind of day where you can just set your watch and you know, every two minutes, the breeze is gonna shift back and forth, but it's the kind of day that you know, okay, the righties are stronger, right? We know that when the righty comes in, it's got one or two knots of pressure that's a little bit higher than those consistent left axis, uh, consistent left breeze. So that's gonna inform whether you're gonna take an inside right or an inside left track over the other one. Earlier I asked the question, you know, what kind of day is it? Is it a speed day or is it a leverage day? This inside track day, this is a leverage day, right? Where we are looking to identify the shift and beat the other boats around us based on the leverage we can assume by optimizing, you know, sailing those shifts up the track. 
So now we're coming off the line. I want you to imagine you're this light blue boat here and we're getting over into the corner. We're getting over into the corner here. So now we're going to talk about the corner game around the track. And I asked earlier, you know, is it a lead back or an edge out day? So what informs whether or not you're going to edge out or you're going to lead back is, is just this, your confidence in where that new stronger breeze is going to come from. Right. And so we've got three boats on starboard coming off the line here. The lime, lime green boat is the lured boat. They're bow out on yellow. Nah, it doesn't really look like they're able to cross, but they're not getting covered. That yellow boat in the middle um, certainly could cross and play through dark blue, but that blue boat is the inside boat, you know? So imagine you've got, you're that dark blue boat. You've got two boats under your jib here and you and your teammate are talking about, you know, we've already decided our game plan, plan A or B is we're going to lead back rather than edge out, right? So as soon as we get to the corner, we know we want to leave out those boats coming back because we believe the shift is going to be the most important thing taking us back to the mark. And we don't want to spend any time being headed here. The flip side of that will be, okay, we're ready to edge out, you know, and you're that yellow boat and that green boat's getting low confidence sailing up to the corner, but you have high confidence that the pressure is going to be better up at that top left side. So no matter what, if that green boat goes, you're just going to hold a little bit longer and play the edge uh, because you have high confidence. There's better pressure over there. Now, there's one really important thing we need to keep in mind here is that we run out of lanes when we get to the corner of the racetrack here. So the closer you get to the corner, or before you get to ley line, lanes start to shut down. So this green cone here is like before ley line, this is the lead back lane. The earlier you tack before the corner, you know, the more lanes you're gonna have, open lanes. You're not gonna have boats tacking on top of you. And the closer you get to the corner, you start to lose lanes, pushing into the corner, pushing into the corner, and then the further you are into the corner of the racetrack, you know, the fewer lanes there are, the more boats that can tack on top of you uh, and potentially you're sailing bad air all the way back to the mark. So something certainly to keep in mind coming in here to the corner. We're working our way up when let's talk about plays at the top. Let's talk about plays at the top of the, of the racetrack as we set ourselves up for our downwind game plan. You know, the goal, I, I remember the first time, like I heard this as a junior sailing kid, the coach was like, you gotta be lifted going into the mark. And we know that we wanna be lifted on the last shift coming into the windward mark. And then you also wanna be obversely headed coming out. And so the goal is, plays at the top of the racetrack, we gotta win this shift and then we gotta win the next one because it's not good enough just to make a good entry to the mark. We got to exit it well as well. So a couple of rules at the top for coming in and we have right pressure. We're in a righty, which means we're pretty wound up on starboard tack. We're lifted on starboard coming into the top mark. If it's a significant shift, significant right shift coming out of the top, we're looking to jibe set, right? So that we can sail the header coming out of the top mark. Coming in the top mark, let's say we're really wound down on starboard. Let's say we made a poor tack approach because there was a left shift coming into that top mark. Now we're looking around the mark, tack set, and we're just going to sail straight. You know, we're going to straight set coming out of the top mark because that lefty is just going to keep winding us down and down and down, pushing our bow close to that gate, closer to the gate mark than if we were on the other jibe downwind couple considerations here as we're playing out the top is your options are limited based on your position to ley line right if you're thin on ley line like you're pinching your sails are trimmed super tight you're high and slow you know it's going to be really hard to have a low lane out of that mark so you know let's make 
lemonade out of lemons. Just have a high set for speed and be ready to extend your position coming off the top mark. Whereas let's say we're fat on lay, you know, let's say we're a little bit above lay line ripping in jibs eased, main sails eased, crew is really low on the wire pressing to get the boat flat. We can, we can have a really nice bear way. We're set to have a nice bear way and get a low set, have a nice low lane to be ready to have an inside jibe, that first jibe coming out of the top mark. We're working our way downwind. And the downwind game, you know, in my opinion, is the most exciting because this is really where you can make big gains on packs of boats, you know, not just one, but uh, a, a pack of boats because of fleet tendencies because of the speeds that you're going and because you can maintain and carry your apparent wind through the job. So let's talk about, let's talk about the run. Let me just move this so that you can see all my, all my notes over here. All right. There's nine ways to pass boats on the downwind, nine ways to pass boats on the downwind. I got to shout out, uh, Skiff coach, skiff guru, Willie McBride, who really uh, hammered this, these truths into me, these opportunities into me. So nine, nine ways to pass downwind is uh, number one with that dark blue boat up at the top is straight setter jibe set, right? This boat's jibe setting uh, because we're in right pressure and they're getting headed out of the top mark. Second way to pass downwind is high set and roll. This happens in breeze, you know, for teams who are trailing another boat and can get the kite up faster, get the crew and skip her out on the wires um, and press and getting the boat flat or in light air, you know, if you have a faster set. So high set and roll, which the pink boat is doing to yellow there in the animation. And then we move on uh, to three through six, which are, which are moves that happen anywhere in the field of the racetrack. But uh, the first one is a low set and a jump. And so we can see the teal boat has a lower set than yellow here coming out of the top mark. And that low lane, they're starting to soak on them. As soon as they see that yellow boat, who's clearly bow forward, start to clean up their spinnaker sheets. The crew starts to toggle up a little bit on the wire. You know, any signals that they're about to jive Teal is ready to go. And as soon as that boat jives, you're gonna jive on them. The goal is to put them in your apparent wind shadow here and then start rumbling and get away from them. After the jump, the next one is an early jibe. Early jibe, we're going back to this dark blue boat here. When do you want to early jibe? You know, something that happens at big fleet events when there's a lot of congestion at the windward mark. It's amazing to see at World Championships, you know, the 29ers are, are consistent with this fleet tendency is that the fleet starts getting wound up coming out of that windward mark on that first job downwind. Because what happens, you know, we already know the high set and roll is a move. We already know the low soak is a move to roll boats around you, roll those boats ahead of you. And as sailors start coming up and up and up, you know, pulling the bow a little bit higher on the downwind, try to protect yourself so you don't get rolled from people coming over top of you. In essence, you're starting to sail five degrees higher than you normally would if you didn't have boats around you. You know, this is where the early jibe comes into play. Now we're playing a leverage game and just have a better angle and open water to sail and mow the boat as you'd like to. Next one is, okay, we didn't early jibe, we held out. And now we're going to sail, you know, if 100% is ley line to the gate mark, now we're going to sail 110%. We're going to sail past, you know, this works, this works in kind of lighter displacement conditions because coming in to the gates high and hot with speed, uh, you're just carrying more boat speed than those around you. And if you can carry speed into those gate marks, you know, you keep your apparent wind up and you can usually get in and out rather quickly. Uh, that sixth way, sixth way to pass boats on the run is to have starboard advantage. And this is a great thing. 
having that starboard advantage, if you're an early jiber boat, like the dark blue one is here on that yellow boat, uh, coming in on port, starboard tack advantage to uh, force boats to jibe out really gives you the opportunity, gives you the space to make some decisions as you'd like and where do you'd like to come into the gate. All right, let's get through the list. You can nail the ley line, you can round the favored mark, or you can be the inside boat at the mark. And we're gonna look at, uh, we're gonna look at some more slides here coming into the gate. Hey, Phil, I'm gonna uh, pause you right there and just ask a question from the audience. Um, Adam Roberts was wondering, at what point do you think teams should start the conversation about whether to jibe set or not? Kind of when that goes oh, in. Yeah, great question. Thanks, Adam. And thanks, Justine, for interrupting me. I mean, you know, I think the top third, I like to break the, the windward leg of the track. So I'm gonna back up here. Um, let's see. I like to break up the racetrack, at least from the starting line to the windward mark into thirds. You know, you come off the line and you have the bottom third, which your opening moves are in. Then you've got like the field of play where you're going to interact with like one to four shifts. And then you've got the top third of the track. And as you're closing in on that top third of the track, you know, if you're on the left side, you're crossing axis, or if you position yourself on the right side of the course coming in, um, when we get to that top third, we've got a real high confidence, I would say, in knowing where the shift's at. You've also got a really good view of not only the breeze ahead of you, which you're going to interact with as you get to the top mark, but also that same breeze is going to carry you downwind for the first minute at least of your downwind. Um, so teams need, to, uh, teams need to be having that conversation. If you're on port crossing through axis, you got to have that conversation before you get to axis. Um, coming into your final tack on starboard ley line, you know, or if you're on starboard ley line, it's certainly happening before you get to the mark. It's happening before you get to the zone, you know, and uh, Tim Wadlow, 49er guru, um, he was saying that he, in his boat, they like to talk about it around that, around that, uh, spot on the racetrack, that top third of the racetrack coming in there. And then when you enter the mark, you know, it's kind of like, are we still on plan A? We still, we still straight setting? Just a quick question and check in between the crew and the skipper. So everybody's on the same game plan, but certainly, certainly before you get to the top marks, got to happen at the top third and then uh, coming out, you're ready and you know what the move is. Great question. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. You got another question for me, Justine? Should I keep rolling with it at this time? No, I think you can keep rolling. Right, I'm going to keep rolling. For that, I'm keep rolling here. So, sweet. All right, coming downwind, we're getting to, we're going to talk about the decision diamond. We're talking about the decision diamond. And if you kind of think back and backtrack, I just went through it too quickly there. But as there are fewer lanes upwind, as we get to the corner of the racetrack, the same is true on the downwind. There's going to be fewer open lanes as you get into the corners of the track. So now we're going to start talking about like fleet tendencies and what people like to do coming out or uh, in high performance races. Out of the windward mark, we've got our straight set here to lay line. Uh, to the course right gate mark. If we don't jive there and we keep going, now we're 100% to course right gate mark. And here's 100% course left gate mark. Okay. Following along, jive setting out of the top. Now we're coming out on port, jive ripping downwind. Here's the 80% mark to course left. Here's 100% to course left. And here's 100% to course right. Okay. Now that we understand what the downwind looks like, where the jiving lanes are, how about some facts for fleet tendencies? So typically what happens is the leaders coming out on a straight set are sending it down to the corner and they're jiving. They're jiving at about 80%. And then they're making their way down through the field because you have a much 
better idea of where ley line is somewhere down in the middle of the course here than you do, you know, way up in the corner. So they're hitting 80% and ripping into the gates here. Whereas if you're jibe setting, you're sailing down, you're probably going to jibe potentially at that 80% mark as well. And then if we think about the nine ways to pass boats downwind, like if you're a trailing boat behind a leading boat, you're either going to jump or you're going to play through and extend. So, you know, what's the confidence level to a boat in the pack who's like 10th, 12th, 22nd, 30th of nailing this ley line into the mark here? So they're going to start to push even more, I would say, uh, into the corner a little bit more, or they're going to be early jiving and coming down. So we've got some traffic zones, you know, more at the edges, especially coming back towards the mark over here. So the leaders are hitting, the leaders potentially are hitting the middle or bottom of this decision diamond, whereas the trailing boats, if you're going for an early jibe, you know, and then you have another jibe, you're coming in at the top of this decision diamond here, which means you're going to have to make another jibe down into the gates. So let's get into the gate. Um, and I think what I'm going to do is go to my trusty whiteboard here. You guys don't know how difficult it is to prepare a slideshow or how difficult it is to keep a sailing coach from whiteboard. So I've got it here. You know, when, I, when we think about the final jive into, into the gate, you know, this is an opportunity to make huge gains on other boats around you. Uh, and what we want to do is use the rules really to help us out. And we're looking to get inside, inside mark room on boats around us. So if you think back to the decision diamond slide, I've got this boat coming in here at 80%. I've got this boat on starboard at 80% over here. And then we've got boats at 100% to a left-hand turn, 100% to a right-hand turn on course. Uh, what is that? Course left gate mark. 100% course left, 100% course right. Okay. So when I think about the gate, it's really helpful to think about positioning yourself in zones. And what I like to do with, with sailors is grade their entrance into the gate. Were they in an A zone or a B zone? You know, unfortunately, in this grading scale, there's really no C or D. It's just an F. You're either in an A or B lane zone coming into the gate or you're in an F. So what is an A lane into the gate? I would say an A lane into the gate pushes all the way into the edge, into the corner here, where you're going to have to do a douse and drop and button hook turn to get in and around. Pushing into the corner here, douse drop button hook turn because you've got inside, inside rights, right? Room to that mark. Whereas boats entering a little bit further outside. So I would give these boats an A, you know, this is an A boat, this is an A boat. Whereas these guys, this is a B for sure. This is a B for sure. And unless this boat at the edge pushes all the way down into the corner, you know, they're also driving into a B or a C lane, you know? And what sets us up for that is that final driving position into the gate dictates your, your options for the exit. Um, hey, um, Phil, I'm going to stop you there real quick. If you um, want to stop sharing your screen, we'll see the whiteboard um, that you're using in full screen. Oh, word. Thanks. So yeah. Yeah. is that a little bit better? Do you think I need to backtrack on that at all, Justine? I mean, yeah, you can do a quick review and I think that'll catch everyone up. Cool. Sorry about that little, you know, this is my uh, early days of the zooming. So just to recap a little bit, you know, we're deciding A, B, or F lanes coming into the gate. Just to review for everybody here, I would say this boat coming down here is 80% to ley line with course right gate mark. This one's 80% to course left. 
Uh, the boat's crossing through the middle here. You know, this one's 100% on course right, 100% on course left. And then we've got our boats 100% and 100% here. The point of this slide, you know, the reason I wanted to draw everything out is like, we're looking for opportunities to pass boats coming into the gate marks. We're looking to make our final job count. How do you make it count? How do you pass boats? You do it with great boat handling. You push deep into the corner. You get to that 100% position to lay line here. And then you have excellent boat handling where you have high confidence. You and your teammate can do a douse and a drop to get out, you know? And based on your position, you know, A, A plus is gonna be inside with that jibe drop. B is you're a little bit outside. So you've got to give priority to those coming in hot at the edges or, you know, you're failing an F if you're jibing, doing an early douse and then sailing low and slow, trying to get in and around the gate. So throw me some questions if you need on yeah, that. We've got, we got a couple questions in here. Um, so just kind of how do you prioritize which variable to take most into account when making decisions kind of do you have any tricks for simplifying things when uh, everything's moving so quickly? Prioritize when making decisions. Can you, what are we talking about, Justine? Hit. Um, I can ask for some clarity, but um, I think just prioritize which variable to um, take into account um, as like weight wise, which one would be kind of your priority when making your decision. Yeah, I think yep. it, well, the easiest way to do it is like, is it a speed day or is it a leverage day? You know, it's a speed day when it's windy, when the boats need to go fast and tacking is slow. It's a leverage day when it's unstable and it's a shifty, shifty breeze day. Uh, or you really don't have a playbook and you're just sailing opportunistically and you're just trying to take the gains as they come along, you're trying to sail the best pressure that's around you um, and connect one dot to the other. So how do we decide? How do we decide whether or not we're gonna do one or the other is uh, a lot of weather prep and forecasting. You know, we're watching the trends throughout uh, the day, 24 hour period. We're watching what the heating is gonna do uh, is it going to shift the breeze at all throughout the day when it gets hot and sunny or is it going to get cloudy and rainy? You know, we're watching the weather and we're trying to decide what's the most relevant and important factor that's going to affect each race. You know, I won't say each day of racing because each race or sometimes each leg is different and just really trying to keep your eyes out uh, and keep the conversation going. You know, are we still at plan A? by deciding what the most relevant factor is to today's racing. You know, yeah. sometimes it's just sea state. Go ahead, Justine. Totally. I think um, kind of just based on that. So having those kind of the solid foundation of what type of day it is, what the weather is doing and what your expectations are. But then when you're in the heat of the moment, considering the shift, the pressure or other boats, kind of if there's any simple ways to, to look at that or what your thoughts are there. Maybe it's a lot of that comes in um, with experience the more and more you race and. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like, there's only two ways to pass boats. You can pass them on the inside or on the outside, right? It's like a car race. It's like, if, if you're driving a car around a track, you're only gonna go around them on the outside of the inside of the lap. So I think, you know, to simplify it in the heat of the moment, it's. For me, like that edge out or lead back conversation is, is really easy to have and really helpful to have. Um, and that just, that gives some confidence and gives some easy clarity for, hey, which side can we pass on today? You know, which side can we pass other boats on? Awesome. Super appreciative that that, uh, that was a good answer. Thanks for and the questions. Uh, just uh, one other follow-up before you move on. Um, is Isabella is wondering if it's ever okay to jive right as you pass rounding the mark to head downwind. So that quick inside jive. Yeah, sometimes it's definitely okay. 
sometimes it's so we're talking about uh jibe set at the top right like sometimes it's the move to jibe set at the top absolutely if uh if you're in i would say when is a jibe set going to be a, a great move coming out of the top mark it's going to be if there's a significant shift in change in the angle of the breeze you know maybe if you're getting five degree shifts not so much, but you know, anything north of that, if we're getting like seven, eight to 20 degree shifts, you know, and you're in a massive righty jibe set out of the top, is going to be a huge move. I would say something to keep in mind is it's always really obvious to me sitting on the coach boat, like who's just throwing a hail Mary pass out there. Who's jibe setting at the top because they just feel like they're in the back and they're ready to roll the dice. And, uh, you know, we're already in 40th place. Like, let's just jive set and see what happens. Um, sometimes psychologically, like that's what you need to do. You just need to clear the air and then sail your boat fast. Um, a lot of what goes into this playbook and this decision making is, you know, let's reduce the risk and lower the chances of, of taking risks on the racetrack. And so I've get, you know, we have some strict parameters. Like we are not jive setting. Some days it's like, we are not jive setting unless X happens. Um, so giving yourself some, some uh, a path to steer through is important. Awesome. I'll, uh, I'll give it you one more question before you um, start talking about that gate entry. So say you are lifted rounding the top mark and want to jibe set. If the pressure is better on the other side, what would you prioritize? Yeah, great question. Um, I would say it depends on what kind of day it is. What kind of day is it? You know, it sounds to me like the person who's asking this question is like drawing, drawing a, a racing scenario where there's better pressure isolated pressure on certain sides of the racetrack. So even though we're in a right shift, there's more pressure on the left side. That's what I'm hearing at least. And I would say if those were the factors of that race course, um, the question is like how much pressure, what, like what's the Delta between puff and lull? Like if we've got, if we've got five knots and a righty, consistent breeze on one side of the course but then it's blowing seven to eight at the top left underneath like a windward shoreline then i would say we're going to straight set and get into that left pressure we're going to prioritize the pressure over the angle um that's such a good question to ask and as you go through your pre-race routine as you do your warm-ups you know that's something we're trying to decide you know, is it speed or is it leverage? Well, if it's a leverage day, you know, we're going to jive out, jive set out of that top mark and be headed on the run. But if it's a speed day, if we're puff hunting, if, you know, we can see the pressure, then we need to sail, sail eyes out of the boat. Um, and we see that pressure at the top left, we're going for it. So a couple like good ways, um, I would say, say to help you make that decision is, and this might be a little bit full on for some people, but if you have the time and if you're interested, I would say read High Performance Sailing by Frank Bethwaite. You know, read his Bethwaite Stability Index. He talks about three ways of racing. You're either sailing opportunistically, which is your puff hunting. Um, you're connecting the dots. You're sailing defensively where you're sailing up the middle right? Or you're sailing minimum lapse time, you're going as fast as possible. And those are our five routes of the high performance racetrack, right? You're either sailing up the middle opportunistically connecting dots, or you're sailing an inside track or minimum lapse time, you're sailing outside track. So um, that'll help the decision-making. I love these questions. I want to keep on them uh, and take any more, Justin, you can interrupt me. I think this is one of the, the last slides here coming out of the gate because we've just come out of the gate. And the question is, are we up or down? You know, are we back on plan a, or are we pivoting to plan B has something changed? Has something changed is the most important question you can ask your teammate 
sailing back up wind. It's like, yeah, something's changed. You know, there's a huge rain cloud on the top right of the track. So we definitely need to get over there um, and get that outflow out of that dark cloud, for example. Uh, and then the rest of the decisions coming up the field are just the same processes as uh, that first upwind that we went to. All right, hit me with another question. Let's see. This is good. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so we have Jack David, who I think you know well. Um, when coming into the Thank gate, <laughs> would um, when coming into the gate, should you sacrifice pushing into the corner to avoid jiving under a boat, even though it may put you at an eighty percent approach? That's a good question. Um, if you're sailing a, a fast boat with an asymmetrical spinnaker, I would say yes because you push into the gate, you push into the corner, and then you're sailing a higher and faster angle. You know, if you're, if you are sailing a symmetrical spinnaker boat, a slower boat, definitely putting yourself in that spot, you're going to be in some potentially slow and bad wind shadow. And, you know, honestly, I'm pretty bad at sailing uh, slow boats. So, uh ask somebody smarter and more experienced than me uh based on what boat you're sailing but great question buddy awesome and, and just a little bit on that kind of transition from maybe slower traditional sailing to a high performance skiff boat what what are some of kind of the the keys that you start working with sailors um to help that transition in terms of getting them kind of up to speed with the the changes of tactics and how they're playing themselves against other boats. Yeah, that's, it's, it's hard, it's hard to make that transition because the angles are so different. Uh, it's, but it's fun to make that transition, right? Like it's fun to learn something new and try to develop new skills, especially if, if you've got a, a really rich background in like dinghy racing, slow boat racing, um, tactical racing, you're going to be great on those opportunistic sailing days. You're going to be great at those, uh, inside track days. I would say sailors who come from like lasers, 420s, opties, sabots, um, you know, you know how to sail up the middle really well. You know how to play shifts well, and you're going to be way smarter than like traditional skiffies or, or fast, you know, speed, speed demons. But then when, when the shift comes, in the dynamic of racing. The breeze is now building, right? Tax become expensive and slow. And now we're skiff racing, we're high performance racing. Um, how do you make that transition? It's like, I would say use this, this playbook. What we're looking to do then is just go fast and find open lanes up the field uh, and decide, you know, taking your opportunity or what are you trying to do? Like making that shift is hard. Yes. Um, you got to understand the angles and you just, you just got to practice. Right. And boat handling really helps make those moves in those high traffic areas. Um, and just have fun with it, have fun learning something new and being bad at it and flipping and, and then watching yourself get better. Awesome. And um, I think there are some opportunities in the Miami area, right, for um, sailors looking to do some high performance clinics and making that transition into either the 29er um, or even boards kind of coming up further into the year. You know, correct? we we hope so. Right. Like um, we don't have any firm dates yet, but I can tell you that. I think what we're going to see this summer is a lot of regional sailing. You know, all the big events are canceled. All the national events are canceled. So as everyone stays within the region, stays closer to home, you know, certainly as soon as we're allowed to safely sail, uh, safely social distance and like, and come together or separately, but meet on the water and sail Miami, my goal is to run, uh, have some fun doing some clinics and some events throughout the summer. So, you know, I've put uh, some ways to contact us at 2-9 or up, up here on the slide. 
you know, we're going to release that as soon as we know when we can program. But uh, it's certainly our intention to run some learn to skiff clinics, um, which and then have some uh, fun competitive series. You know, it may not be what you've experienced as a traditional regatta in the past because we have to adapt and modify based on new rules and restrictions but uh certainly we're gonna we're gonna have some fun on the water and uh help people make the transition into the skiffs yeah awesome and he put up his um instagram handles the website definitely great to follow if you want to just learn anything about high performance sailing tactics, what's going on um, in that realm. There's tons of good stuff going on. Um, so before we wrap up, Phil, I did have a couple additional questions come in. Um, if uh, you were stuck under boats going upwind, how do you decide if you should tack and get out or there or stay there? How do you decide? Okay. Um, if, okay. Great question. I love it. If you're stuck under bad boats going upwind, get out of there. And the question is not like, should you get out of there or not? You should get out of there. Yes. But okay, now we're out of there. What do we do? And the question for me is like, do you take two or do you just take one? So this picture that I've posted up here is from, um, this is a knacker playbook from the Europeans last May in Weymouth. And so coming off the starting line, you can see this path is a boat taking a quick two tacks. So this is assuming like you're coming off the starting line and you're in a bad position. Like, yes, you should get out of there. How do you decide if you should get out of there? Well, you should. Um, you should never sail bad breeze. So are you going to take one or two? You're going to take two if your game plan is to get to that top left side, right? Your game plan is if if in a perfect world with you had a great start, you would hold and push your way out to the corner. Um, or you're just going to take one getting out of there and finding something else. So it just kind of comes down to what, what kind of day is it? Are we sailing, you know, puff hunting or are we trying to get somewhere on the racetrack? Do we have high confidence that there's breeze in that, in that side that we're going to? So good question. Awesome, Phil. Um, one more is Andy's wondering if there are any other books or resources that you would recommend. Oh man. Uh, uh, thanks Andy. I'm a big reader and uh, I have learned a ton from some books. I mean, if you haven't read um, Dave Perry's winning in one designs, do it. I would say pick up high performance sailing. It's huge. Like it's a ridiculous read. Uh, don't try to read it at once, read it in small little chunks, but Frank Bethway's high performance sailing is, you know, the Bible for, for skiff cat sailors, fast boat racers, apparent wind racers. Um, when it comes to building weather strategies and trying to apply playbooks, and with weather conditions, read Dave Houghton and Fiona Campbell's wind strategy, which is a phenomenal one. Um, I try to read it on the plane whenever I fly to a regatta, just as a good refresher and reminder. Uh, he's also got some different venue specific stuff in there. Um, those are my top, those are top three great books you should pick up and read. My bookshelf is like back there behind me, which you can see, I could probably grab a stack and get it, but uh, that'll get you started. Awesome. Um, we had one other question come in from Julian Scarrett. When do you make the decision to tack when you have to pinch to make the top mark? When you are having to pinch to make the top mark? Thank you, Julian. Julian, thank you for this question. Um, when do you decide when you make the decision when you have to tack to pinch like okay in the five in the stages of grief like there are five stages when something bad happens and you're grieving and i know this is an extreme like answer to this simple question but this is how i think of it like 
acceptance is the fifth and final step to the grieving process. And as a sailor, you have to get to acceptance immediately. Like whether you're pinching to the top mark, you're going slow and you know you need to take two tacks, like take the two tacks. When you're coming off the starting line and you're losing your lane and you know you need to get out of there, like get out of there, get past like depression and bargaining bargaining and anger and uh, denial, like get past all those steps and freaking tack, just take two and then get back to your planning game plan and go fast. Questions keep coming in. Um, cool. I, think we, I think we have enough, some time for a couple more, at least one more. Um, so Theodore, I've recently been sailing the 49er FX and in light wind. How does the crew trap off the bow without getting the trapeze stuck on the shroud? Yeah, good question. So it's definitely tricky. Um, so what Theodore is talking about is there are, you know, there's two sets of spreaders on the FX rig and the 49er rig. And what happens is as the crew moves forward around the wing to get to the bow, the, the trapeze wire can hook one of the spreader tips and then you have this really jolting like banjo effect uh, dropping in. So, you know, one thing you can do is you step, as you step out and get forward, you just like, the crew needs to make sure to carry that trapeze wire with you. Um, because of the lowers on the FX and the 49er, it's pretty hard to like pass through that's it's it's yeah you can't pass through there what am I talking about you can't pass through there so you have to like go or out and around forward so I would say use the use the shrouds for stability and like with your backhand bring your trapeze out and around and then bail clip in and then you've got a spider-man off the bow and the wing of the 49er just in your position so you're not hooking that thing but it happens you know it happens you get used to it Practice, 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 right? <laughs> That's it. Um, well, Phil, this was awesome. Thank you so much. This is really great. Um, this video will be on the Starboard Portal for anyone who missed it or would like to share. Um, and thanks to all the viewers for tuning in. If uh, you want to see any more of Phil, um, definitely check out the 2 Niner High Performance Racing Program. Their website um, is listed in the description. If you enjoyed today's session, Please support our efforts to build community of active and engaged sailors through the Starboard Portal by purchasing or renewing a U.S. sailing membership. We have lots of great content coming up on the, on the schedule, and thanks to U.S. sailing members, we are able to adapt and evolve to better serve sailors with content like this. Visit us at ussailing.org membership to join or renew U.S. sailing today. Thanks again, Phil, and everyone enjoy the rest of their Tuesday afternoon. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. It was a pleasure. Uh, and thanks, Justine. Thanks, U.S. Sailing. Cheers. <laughs>